Okay, great. So, hi everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today as we kick off with the first of our Look Forward webinars. This series is all about scale and keeping things running smoothly across the customer journey as your e-commerce store grows. Why did we feel it was so important to talk about scale? Well, the fact is that there are a lot of positives to becoming a bigger business. You start to benefit from economies of scale, you worry less day to day about every individual sale, and you start to bring more hands on deck. You're able to invest in more tools, more technologies. But there are a couple of drawbacks to navigate as well. You might not be so concerned about each and every sale, but that means you get slightly further away from each individual customer. You might have a bigger team, but that's more people to communicate your brand tone of voice to consistently. And with every new tool, you need to ensure that you're proving ROI as well. But none of these problems are insurmountable, which is why we're bringing together some of the industry's leading e-commerce experts to share their insights on how to successfully scale your store. Today, we're here to talk about acquisition, that very first stage in the customer journey, because we all know that first impressions count. And I'm really pleased to have two experts with me who know everything there is to know about acquisition. So a really warm welcome to Phil Mormon, who joins us from Shogun, and Katie Crichet from Octane. Phil and Katie, can I ask you to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll go ahead. Uh, so I'm Phil Mormon, Director of Marketing at Shogun. Uh, what we do at Shogun is help e-commerce companies or brands build uh, more engaging websites with our drag and drop tool, Page Builder. Uh, and we also have a new offering for enterprise, enterprise clients called Shogun Frontend for those looking to move into the headless commerce space uh, and build a sub-second progressive web app front end. Brilliant, and over to you, Katie. Perfect, um, I'm Katie. I work for Octane AI. So Octane AI is a Facebook Messenger and SMS automation platform. Um, so just like you'd use email marketing, you can do the exact same on Facebook Messenger and SMS. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping, housekeeping before we get started. I've got some questions for Phil and Katie here, but we'll also be taking questions from the audience. So please do drop your questions into the chat box and we'll come to them at the end. If we don't have time to get to all of your questions, then we'll do our best to get back to you after the webinar. So now I'm just gonna get rid of this presentation so you can all see Katie and Phil a bit more clearly. Okay, and off we go with question one. So, what I'd love to know from both of you, what is your favorite channel for e-commerce businesses to use to acquire new customers and why? Uh, Phil, let's start with you. So I'm a big fan of organic, but I know a lot of people uh, argue against that because it takes time. My argument against that is it's always gonna take time. So start from day one, uh, building up that organic presence. And that could be uh, starting with blog posts around what your brand is doing, how your brand is helping the community, working with nonprofits, uh, and just sharing that brand story. Um, second to that is mostly just word of mouth. Uh, I like to engage when I start new brands uh, and when I you know, work with little side projects, I like to, from the very beginning, directly communicate with my fan base. Um, and that's reaching out to specific people, uh, asking them how things are going, uh, and even asking them for feedback. That is the biggest thing. So I like to start Slack channels or like uh, private Facebook groups where I'll send mock-ups or new product ideas or whatever uh, to the group to get their feedback. I don't always use that feedback, but I like to make sure that those initial community members that I'm building uh, trust with uh, actually feel special and feel kind of engaged with the brand itself. And those people I think the average, someone did a study, I forget who did the study, but the average person that interacts with your brand at that point shares it with six other people. So continuing to engage with your community like that, you're building this natural kind of netting below your brand or foundation below your brand uh, that you can expand upon eventually. Mm. I, yeah, you're right. It's so important to build that community because then you've got a way of keeping in touch with people in between their purchases and their visits as well. And um, Katie, would you, do you have anything to add to that? I do. I'm a little biased because we do messenger and SMS. <laughs> um, so I'll be really specific. I think people are scared to open up new channels, but it doesn't mean that you have to like fully focus on them and like build them out to no end. You can automate them. You can set up um, different basic automations that actually point back into your email. Um, so if you're looking to acquire new customers, let's say you get a lot of like Facebook comments you could use something called Facebook comment capture 
which replies to every first Facebook comment that you get, opts them into Messenger, and then you can actually point them back to your site or back to email. Um, so you can use different channels that you're not using already to try and point people either back to your site or to your email um, to become a list subscriber. I did like Phil's point as well. I think referrals are huge. So if you can work referrals into your emails or like post-purchase process, um, that's a really big way to try and get word of mouth and have that track. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, something like uh, customers who are referred are four times more likely to complete a purchase than, than um, customers acquired in other ways. So it's definitely a powerful channel. I have a feeling we'll be coming back to that. Um, Katie, another question for you. So you mentioned sort of using um, some new channels like Facebook and SMS, but are those channels all created equally or should you treat them differently? So for example, does the same approach work on Facebook as SMS or do you need to treat them as a totally separate ball game? So each channel does have different regulations or rules of engagement. Um, what we would typically recommend is Messenger is a really great two-way communicator because you can have quick replies within Messenger that makes it super easy to have a two-way conversation. Um, SMS, it is a little more invasive. So we typically recommend like maybe one to two per month if you're gonna send them um, and make sure that they're super timely if it's like a sale or something that requires their attention right away um, and working it into email flows. So for instance, if you integrated us with Clavio, you can start to say, okay, if this person um, is an email subscriber, send them this email, or if they're a messenger subscriber, don't send them an email, but send them um, a message on Facebook so that you're segmenting the different channels. Um, so I think they definitely work really well alongside each other, um, depending on who your customer is, and then taking into account like the open rates um, and how invasive they are. Mm. So really good. I hadn't really thought about one way versus two way comms. And actually, as that's a really interesting point, you know, you're going to, you need different rules for different messages, wouldn't you? you need, there are some things that is just a, um, hey, your order's on the way, doesn't require a response. Um, but then there are other things where you really want to create that dialogue. That's a really good point. Um, great. So Phil, another question for you. As you scale, obviously measuring everything becomes really important. Reporting on everything becomes really important. You've got to make some slightly more difficult, complicated decisions. What metrics do you think an e-commerce business should be using to determine if an acquisition channel is delivering a positive ROI or not? Yeah, well, we'd start the basic conversion rate. Um, if you're not getting sales, obviously that's not working. Um, but particularly when it comes to, let's say, Facebook ads or any sort of ad campaign, uh, your bounce rates on your landing pages are huge. Um, that is a direct component of how much your ads are actually costing you. So I would focus heavily on that. If you're seeing above like 70% or 80% bounce rates on your landing pages from your ad campaigns directly, you may need to refine your messaging on those ads or look into what you're actually offering on that landing page. If it's clear, uh, if there's a, an actual direction you're giving people to flow through the landing page. I know a lot of people throw a lot of clutter in their, into their landing pages. I like to keep things simple. Uh, people's attention is you know, easily taken away from them or they're easily distracted within a couple seconds. So uh, bounce rate. Um, and then you can just, I mean, obviously look at your ad metrics uh, as well. To, you know, if your ads are costing you well above what your products are worth, you may want to refine that campaign. Um, but yeah, it's bounce rate and convergence. You look at those and then you can draw back and look, you know, am I getting enough users to actually make sure that this test is accurate? I like to make sure I'm getting at least 1,200 people to visit a page first. That puts it at like 95% uh, accuracy rate or statistically uh, significant. So yeah, from there. Just look at your users and make sure you're getting enough traffic. Mm, brilliant. Those numbers are really helpful for people. Thank you. And um, Katie, what would you say are the important metrics? Definitely conversion rate. Um, if your goal with specific targeted ads or messages is to create list growth, the amount of opt-ins that you're generating from a specific source can be huge. Um, then you can see like from that list growth, what's the actual conversion rate to purchase. Um, and try and increase the amount of messages that you're receiving on Messenger, for example, to grow your Messenger list. And again, that's a really good point. I, I guess the metrics just depend on the goal, don't they? And then the, the goal depends on the channel and not all channels will have the same goals and the same metrics by default as a result. 
Fantastic. Um, so next question, and um, we talked a bit about landing pages, good practice, um, etc. What would be your number one guiding principle for ensuring that people get a really consistent experience when they hit your store? So I know, for example, you know, Google's really up waiting in their algorithms, whether your kind of your search, your SERP delivers the same thing that your page delivers. And it's the same thing if your Facebook group or community or page or whatever tells one story and then your website tells another not a great experience um, same if you've got an in-store and an online experience it should be really consistent so what would, yeah what would be your number one guiding principle for somebody looking for that consistency uh, let's start with Katie yeah I think something that our account management team really helps people with is figuring out their voice um, so trying to figure out like what's your copy like on your website versus in your emails versus on messenger versus your customer support team. Like it should be consistent across the board so that someone feels like they're always interacting with the same brand. Um, so working that in any way you can into any message, like a GIF or images, videos, um, and working that into the site itself. So I think there's a really good site. Um, it's called rockthebells.com. I think it's by LL Cool J. But they do a really good job of incorporating um, like experience into the site itself. So they have videos, they have content, um, they have messaging channels, and it's all super interactive and has the exact same voice about it. Mm, brilliant. I know certainly from my time in marketing, it, is, it can be one of the bigger challenges as you scale, actually keeping that tone of voice consistent and making sure that each person, each department, each team is putting it out there in the same way. Um, but yeah, to have, have that consistency is is super important yeah uh, phil anything to add yeah from a technical perspective uh obviously you know page design and layout and stuff like that you, you'd want to be consistent across your site but uh, a big thing and a lot of store owners don't realize this but having a content delivery network um basically you know that allows customers let's say in san francisco and new york uh in the uk to have the exact same experience because your website's being served by local servers uh when you're on a cdn network without that uh, let's say your your site is hosted in the UK and you're shopping from San Francisco, it's going to be incredibly slow. Uh, it's going to be a terrible experience. So making sure you're set up on a CDN um, is, is a huge one, something that we advocate for, especially now that page speed uh, has, you know, many, many tests have shown page speed is directly correlated with conversion rates and your revenue. And also your SEO success now more than ever as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. That actually leads really nicely into our next question. So Phil, um, kick off with you on this one as well. Obviously, more and more shoppers are going online, particularly with the events of the last couple of months. So um, you've got to recreate the idea of a shop window, you know, you've got to draw them in. Um, but you also then have to replicate the in-store experience once they're on your site. And that's really hard. It's something that e-commerce people have been grappling with for years is how do I make it the same on a website as I do when I've got a person living and breathing my brand. So how do you recommend that stores recreate the in-store feel when they're online? Yeah, absolutely. So this is something that we've run into, especially here in the States. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the news, things aren't the best here uh, when it comes to opening back up. But uh, we've had a lot of retailers reach out and just ask you know, how to get set up. So baseline, what Katie said, make sure your tone of voice is set, all right? So making sure you translate that over to your website is huge. Uh, but what I'm seeing, uh, a lot of more e-commerce stores are actually moving to video. People, when people shop retail, you know, they want to touch, they want to feel, they want to see, uh, or even smell, depending on what you're selling. Um, so giving people video that describes or helps uh, fulfill those senses is a really big key, I think, now moving forward in the e-commerce space. And somebody that does it really well, uh, the site called Revzilla, uh, they sell motorcycle gear. And basically, they have videos for every single product. They have thousands of products. Every single product they have, uh, the host of their videos describes how the leather feels, how the boots fit, how it feels to stand in them, with the, like how hard the outside shell is of a helmet or, you know, everything. Uh, they even have people wearing the goods so you can see how it looks on, on an individual. So moving forward in that direction, I think is going to be very important for e-commerce stores. Um, and yeah, just even in your copy, when you're, you're describing the product, um, like reach out and, and like basically help people understand what these products actually feel like in person or what they can expect when they receive the goods. 
yeah I think that's uh, as a consumer the shopping that I've been doing recently people who have that kind of full 360 degree view of a product or you can see it on other people but see them moving in it and it's it's absolutely invaluable to decision making Katie what would you add to that yeah I really like video um I know I'm finding now that I'm buying more things online especially like skincare products hair care products it's super confusing if you're going to like sephora.com and you just see the catalog and you have no idea what's actually correct for you so I think working it either into the product page where there's some education about like who's who's this product for um and some sort of storytelling within the product page itself um video like phil said or even um i've seen beard brand do a really good job of like providing a quiz um right on the home page where you enter the site hit the quiz um, and you actually have to take the quiz um, in order to purchase the product so that does a really good job of almost being like your sales associate. Um, another good tactic is actually using Messenger um, on-site chat. So you can have it pop up on the site when someone visits and say, hey, like, do you need help with something? Are you looking for something? And have automated answers based on what their questions are, which is mm. also cool. Brilliant. Yeah, I think um, my favorite examples that I've seen recently were, um, both uh where lively and astrid and me me astrid and me did um sort of virtual assistant virtual online styling um when they had to move fully online and it was just such a nice a nice change because we've talked for years and years and years about replicating an in-store experience online and now they've actually kind of had to go ahead and, and do that and i really hope it's something that they'll continue to do because that you know that's such a great service for so many shoppers who are who are predominantly online so yeah i hope that some of these some of these developments will continue brilliant um so so the next step if um if you're doing all these things but you're finding that your website traffic actually is decreasing even though you're trying to scale um what metrics or areas should a brand be reviewing to identify those potential issues or missed opportunities that are causing website traffic to decline? Um, Katie, do you want to kick off on that one? Yeah, um, I think you should probably be looking at like direct traffic versus organic and focusing on that organic is probably a missed opportunity. So I know even on like the software side, we have blogs and we create content and we try to rank for searches. But I think brands can do the exact same thing that software tries to do, um, creating evergreen content. So like I know Homestick Candles actually has a really great blog and they rank for a ton of like candle content. So if you Google like, how do I burn a candle? They're one of the top results um, in their blog. So that helps you land on their page, on their blog, they retarget you, maybe they have a pop-up where you can join their email list. Um, and that organic traffic is a really great way to get eyeballs on your site. And it's funny, I think a lot of people think that what they're selling isn't content worthy. So, I mean, candles is actually a fantastic example. As you were talking, I was thinking, what would I write about for candles? And then I thought, well, there's so much how to meditate with candles, how to have candles to relax you, how to, you know, sleep patterns. There's a thousand and one or different scented candles for different types of things you know um I could I could write about candles all day apparently <laughs> so that's a great point thank you uh Phil how about you yeah Katie brought up some good points there's actually a CBD brand I'm, their name is I can't think of it right now but they have so much great content around education um a lot of people ask, there's a lot of questions around CBD and they they understand that and they're addressing it uh like how to use CBD what are the benefits of CBD how do the other cannabinoids affect the body stuff like that um, and they even address things like, um, you know, will this get me in trouble at work, right? Will using CBD uh, show up on a drug test and stuff like that? So they're, they're, what they're doing is they're going out and reaching out to the community and looking for these questions their community is asking. Uh, and that can be either directly through feedback and stuff like that, or um, you can even do that through like using Google's keyword tool to look at what people are actually searching for, or that trick where you type in Google and the rest is filled out. Uh, and using those questions to create content. Uh, but what I would look at first, and if, if my traffic is declining, is look at what's happening in, in like the economy as a whole. So uh, with COVID, we notice there are essential and non-essential products, is basically how they're labeled, and new essential as well. So 
uh, essential products are like your toilet papers or certain types of food. Your non-essentials are like jewelry and like pants where, you know, you don't need as many pants now that you're doing video calls. Um, and then the new essential is like desks and monitors and everything you need to set up your new home office. Um, you know, understand your industry and figure out, is it the industry that's going down or is it my site specifically? Uh, you can even reach out to maybe not competitors, but other brands in the same industry to see how things are, are working with them. Uh, but yeah, like Katie said, I would look at each channel as well. So like using Google Analytics, you can see is my direct versus organic. Uh, is there a major change there? How are my paid channels doing? Um, I would do that diagnosis first. And then um, from there, you can kind of siphon it down to, okay, is it specific products within my website that I'm seeing decline? Um, or is it just you know the site as a whole? And then from there, you need to figure out which channel is actually kind of faring okay and focus your budgets and attention to those channels. Yeah, I think one one good thing to come out of perhaps the past few weeks is we, as marketers, we've maybe stopped focusing on trying to do everything and just trying to do everything that is effective right now or has the biggest impact on your ROI right now, which is you know potentially a good thing. And um, Phil, you've mentioned kind of looking around for industry insights and things and trends. Are there any tools that you could recommend um, people use to kind of get that insight? Obviously, you mentioned talking to other people selling similar things, but is there anywhere in particular that you go to find out what's happening and whether you're consistent with the industry? Yeah, so Google Trends is always kind of like the beginning step for me. Uh, it's good to see you know, what people are searching for and what the trend is on that search. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, usually a pretty good indicator of what's happening. Uh, but then there's also what happened with COVID is a lot of uh, e-commerce companies created their own or started sharing their own data. So uh, I know ShipBob has a bunch of charts and stuff based on their customer data that shows you know, these products you know, aren't nearly as popular right now and these products have actually shot up. So looking for you know, content created like that, I think would be a really big uh, key there, uh, but also your own data. I think your own data is the biggest indicator uh, and making sure that your tracking is set up properly uh, from the get-go, which is actually kind of hard to do. So if you need to have some sort of consultant or whatever audit your tracking, um, I highly recommend that because that's gonna be your North Star um, moving forward. I think that's a, a, another really good point is um, the skills that you have uh, at the start of your journey may not be the same skills that you need to scale. So uh, most marketers have a, a good grasp of Google Analytics, but when you get into the realms of Google Tag Manager and that side of things, it becomes infinitely more complicated each each time. And so, yeah, getting someone to just double check. There's no harm in getting someone to double check you're doing things right, I guess, as you grow. Fantastic. Um, just a reminder for our listeners that you can ask any questions that you want us to discuss in the chat box along the way. Um, next up, Katie, let's go back to you. Um, what would be your advice for brands who believe that they have to participate in seasonal sales to acquire new customers and achieve long-term growth? Um, I'm not sure what the statistic is. I think Shopify released a list of statistics like um, after this past BFCM and majority of purchasers for brands are past customers. Um, so I don't think like throwing a huge discount on your brand is necessary to acquire new customers. I think it's really good for past customers, but if it's like at the detriment to your brand, then I wouldn't go that route. Um, you can definitely participate without actually giving a huge discount as well. So if you wanted to create like a mystery box we've seen done um, or some way to reward past customers in a really exciting way, that would be cool as well. Um, whether it's like a non, a non discount offer like mystery box or like early access to some new product, um, just something that gets them excited about the brand and helps them visit the site again when they're in a super spendy mood. <laughs> super spendy I love it yeah I think that's a good point and I think it's it's more widely acceptable to not necessarily get involved in every single um discount period now particularly if you're offering something of value consistently to customers that come back and um, Phil do you have anything you'd like to add yeah I mean it, one depends on your brand if it's off brand to give discounts uh definitely do not participate in any of the discounts uh, but also your audience. So for example, my mother loves to shop at Kohl's. I don't know if there's Kohl's in the UK, but so Kohl's is basically um, targeted at her age group 
and there's somehow everything is 70% off all the time. Uh, and you know, they really work that kind of high you get when you get a discount. So being, you know, being stuck in that mindset or being trained to think that way, like you can't buy anything unless it's 70% off. Uh, if that's your audience, obviously participating, participating more in those discount uh, time periods is, is almost necessary to keep things moving forward. But uh, I recommend just as a general e-commerce store, limiting your discounts as much as possible because it does tarnish the brand. And it does set expectations that your products aren't worth what you're actually charging for them. So people will actually wait to purchase uh, until they go on sale. So be very, very picky about how you participate in those sales. Mm. I think there's so many other ways you can reward people now. You know, I mean, obviously, again, I'm a little biased because this is how we make up a lot of our loyalty programs. But the kind of experiential rewards, if you can have early access to um, new product lines, that's worth more to people than um, a little bit of money off. You know, they're getting something exclusive. Or if you can um, give people special access to content or communities that they can't join in other ways, you know, then they, they, like you said earlier, that trust is there, but also they're getting something special, um, which is worth paying a little bit, not even extra for, worth paying normal price for, perhaps. Yeah, there's actually a good example. So REI, outdoor brand here, um, they, when you sign up, like, it's, it's not necessarily per purchase, but what they do is to reward customers that become members is you actually get a portion of the like revenue back uh, as like, you're not necessarily a shareholder, but at like certain periods, I don't know if it's quarterly or yearly, they actually give you a cut of profit. Really? Um, just for being a member and shopping at the store. Wow. That would, you'd feel very good about every penny you spent with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Brilliant. Great. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, brand tone of voice and things like that. Um, but what I'm interested in is uh, consistency across channels is also something we've covered. So lots of larger stores will be using multiple communication channels to acquire their customers and communicate either um, those sales that we've talked about or alternative messages in between purchases. How do you stop those messages tripping over each other? So for example, if you're sending emails, can you also send Facebook Messenger messages or SMS or does it clash? Katie, perhaps you could lead us on that one. Yeah, so you can segment nearly everything within your email provider. Um, make sure that your channels are integrated. I think that's super important so that you can segment them. Um, that way you can say, if this person's an email subscriber and not an SMS subscriber, send them an email. But if they are an SMS subscriber, don't send them any emails and then you can send them the SMS. Um, I think it's also worth noting how they came in. Like if you can see where you acquired them, it's probably likely that they're more engaged on that channel. So if they're more engaged on SMS, you'll probably do better sending them an SMS than capturing them on SMS and then moving them over into email. Um, so I think, yeah, just noting who belongs to what list and making sure that it's all segmented and that when you're sending out, let's say it's like a product launch, when you're timing all those messages, you can send them at the same time, but just make sure each audience is excluded from the other. Hmm. Brilliant. Phil, do you have anything to add on channels and clashing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what Katie said, segmentation is huge uh, and making sure that you have the proper segmentation put in place. Uh, it can be very hard though for, you know, smaller to mid-sized e-commerce stores. These tools can sometimes be very costly uh, that you're working with. So um, at that point, uh, what I would recommend for those stores is just focus on your best performing channel. Could be two, three channels at most. Uh, and, you know, once you scale and once you start, you know, learning about your audience, um, then you can kind of start expanding into things like uh, SMS or additional types of email or messenger, or, you know, wherever you want to kind of try, you know, poke into the industry next, I guess. Mm. Brilliant. I guess um, one question that comes to mind for me, it's something that I'm always conscious with um, in marketing is as you, as you grow your, your tools, as you say, some of them are very costly, but you, as you scale, you do, you're able to bring on more tools, invest in more technology do you think there's a risk to your personalization there? If you, if everything's automated, if everything's triggered or in a flow, how do you keep that kind of personal one-to-one -one feel about your store and your marketing as you grow? Um, let's start with Katie on that one. Yeah, I think if you're collecting data in any way, so let's say 
you have some sort of conversation on Messenger on like an on-site chat and you're talking with someone as they shop, um, you can collect that data and sync that into your email, your ads, or Facebook Messenger channel. Um, using that, you can do it automatically with segmenting, which can get complicated depending on how much you're trying to collect on people. Um, but you can use that data. I think Phil had a really good point with before you add a channel, just take an audit of what you have already um, and don't set it live before almost going through every flow that could possibly happen. So like if someone abandons a cart, are they going to get a push notification, an email and an SMS at the same time? Don't set it live yet, figure out how to segment it and then test it out yourself um, and then launch that channel. It's mm, a great point. Definitely. And um, Phil. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as marketing grows uh, and becomes more advanced, I feel like we, we've kind of moved away from that personal touch. Um, so sometimes I recommend taking the time, obviously have your automation set up, uh, but don't necessarily rely on it. Sometimes like a personal email or a personal note uh, is the key to actually growing your audience. And that doesn't necessarily scale. Um, but, you know, doing it to a select subgroup of your audience, I think uh, over time will actually return uh, tenfold uh, eventually. So like Katie said, you know, it comes down to segmentation and making sure that your, your flows are set up properly. But at the same time, don't forget your customers. They are human and they do appreciate uh, that personal touch. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I think that's something we'll come back to in every single one of this series, actually. Um, you know, empowering your customer service support team as well so that they're delivering the best experiences and just keep, yeah, keeping in, in touch the whole way, whole way through as, as humans. I think that's such a good point. Um, just one more question that springs to mind and then we'll move on to the, um, the questions from the audience. But do you think there's a danger of trying to collect too much data as you grow and then just not knowing what to do with it? Phil, do you have a point of view on that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, analysis paralysis is what it's called. Uh, there absolutely is too much data. So figure out, you know, what are the, you know, maybe four or five metrics that impact your revenue the most, focus on those. Uh, and you can, you can venture out every once in a while, look at other metrics, obviously, uh, especially when things are declining, you don't quite understand. So pull in those other metrics, but uh, day, day to day, just focus on just a handful of metrics that directly impact your revenue. Um, I know with these tools like Segment uh, that can pull in data from every single tool you have and, and pour it into single, you know, pour it all into like Google Analytics, for example. It's just too much. Uh, unless you have a team of data analysts, uh, it, it's too much to focus on. And honestly, um, at that point, uh, when you are pulling in that much data, you, you know, that's when you're probably an enterprise level company where a half percent increase in re our, you know, your conversion rate actually equals millions of dollars. So it's worth it to invest in those data analysts. But when you're a mid-sized company or you're making say less than 10 million a year in revenue, just focus on the handful of metrics at first. Mm. Great point. Katie? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think we, when we're helping somebody collect data through Messenger, we try and get them to pick like four or five key personalization points that they might use to either send emails or send messages. So like if you're a skincare brand, what age are you? And they might want to know, are you under a certain age or over a certain age? And that can help them better tailor messages. So I think figuring out maybe like five key data points that actually help you really drive conversion. Um, but I think Phil is a great point that beyond that, if you're getting way too in depth, it's probably not going to move the needle too far. So we should probably mostly leave the data reservoirs and AI and BI <laughs> until we're um, playing with the real big guys. <laughs> Fantastic. So we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Don't forget, if you've got anything else you want to ask, drop it into the chat now. Um, first up, we have, what ways can brand stories be presented from Facebook to direct to email? What's the step? So I think if I'm interpreting the question correctly, um, how can you present your brand story consistently across all those different channels what's important when you're telling your brand story and um, phil could you kick us off yeah uh, it comes down to doing an exercise where you define uh what what the mission is what uh the tone is uh what your purpose is essentially for your brand um, without that written down somewhere it's you're going to have a very loose definition floating around to each of those channels um, so that's an exercise that i recommend every brand do it, it can be 
uh, a bit tedious while you know you debate over this word or that word or you know how we present ourselves but it's it's an exercise that's absolutely worth doing um, and then from there it makes translating that message um, on each channel significantly easier um, and of course you know consistency in terms of design as well you know we're very uh, visual creatures so making sure that your illustrations and your header images and all that all align from your blog to your email uh, to Facebook uh, and, and therefore like and so forth so it's just a process that you need to start from the very beginning and build that foundation first yeah I completely agree with that Katie definitely um, picking one story and making sure it's consistent I know as a good example like one of our brands named polysleep they do a really good job of presenting their brand on all channels so their emails are consistent with their messenger and that's consistent with their support reps um, so they actually went as far as to say like to their support reps you need to sound like amy poehler when you're giving support so they actually gave it a real voice um, and that's the voice that's consistent across their entire website as well brilliant and i think um stores perhaps underestimate how many channels they can communicate their story across as well so a couple of examples that i love from um, our customers but Pacifica Beauty, for example, they really care about sustainability. And as part of their loyalty program, if you recycle some of your packaging, then you can earn points for doing that. Um, we also have a pet food brand um, and they, it, you can donate your points instead of claiming a reward, you can actually donate to a, a um, dog shelter instead of getting something for yourself. And it's just a nice way of really standing by the values that you share with your customers and continuing to tell that story through multiple touch points um, which I think is really important. Great, uh, next question is a little more technical um, I'll be honest I'm potentially not the best person to answer this but um, in terms of ideal e-commerce platforms um, what's the best what would you say was the ideal platform for a retailer setting up an online store with 20,000 or more products um, and then follow-up question is WordPress a secure CMS tool? Um, that might be one to come back to, or do, I, do either of you have any point of view on that? I can touch on some of that. Um, so I've used WordPress and WooCommerce for probably most of my sites. Um, it's, it is secure, uh, as long as you're keeping up to date with all the updates uh, and making sure that all the plugins that you've used uh, are also consistently updated. Um, that can be very tedious, though. So if, if you want to be more hands-off, I would not recommend moving to WooCommerce. Um, but other stores, Big Commerce or Shopify, they're all great solutions. Um, if you're looking for a bigger, kind of more enterprise level product, um, you can move towards like Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Uh, that's something that we support and we see that's where our uh, enterprise level customers are usually focused. Uh, and then Magento uh, sits in between kind of where Big Commerce and Shopify um, address the market as well. So. There are options out there uh, when you're doing 20,000 products. I think that was in the question. Mm -hmm. uh, it just comes down to, well, it comes down to a couple of things. One, making sure your image sizes and all the images that you upload and videos that you upload are optimized. Otherwise, it doesn't matter which CMS you're working with. It's going to be a nightmare uh, to load. So, um, yeah, it just comes down to properly uploading those products first. But I think all, the, all of those CMSs do just fine. Fantastic. And I think one thing I'd add um, is that it's worth looking at what you can get around that CMS as well. So for example, Shopify, Magento, BigCommerce, they all have the app stores and they you can plug in so many different tools and technologies via those app stores without having to go off and build something yourself or invest in um, you know, really long contracts with uh, scary, huge tools that you don't necessarily know how to use effectively just yet. So as you're scaling, you can try lots of different apps and tools as you go. Um, so it's worth looking at kind of the surrounding um, ecosystem as well, I think. And um, one more question. So what are the additional platforms and or resources to look into when you're trying to acquire new customers? Um, so if you're struggling to gain new customers um, because your traditional strategies have been around events and um, obviously those events are now long, no longer running what additional platforms should you be looking at um, Katie let's go with you first that's a really good question um, 
One thing that we probably recommend is running prospecting ads. So prospecting using lookalike audiences, if you um, can get those through Facebook, um, trying to prospect new customers who are similar to people who have purchased in the past. One thing that you can do as well um, is create what's called a click to messenger ad. So instead of sending someone to a landing page where they could bounce or sending someone to the site, um, you could send them into a messenger conversation, which does opt them in, and then you can actually retarget them with a direct message. So that's a really cool way. Um, Facebook comment capture, which I think I mentioned before, where you can reply to organic comments that you get on Facebook. So if you even boost a post to get people to comment on that post, you can then send them a message if they reply to that, which is a cool trick as well. Um, so that can help you increase your marketing list and then in turn um, increase your customer base. Mm, fantastic. Thank you. And Phil, over to you. Yeah, it really depends on the brand and the customers. Like, where is your audience? Um, I know plenty of brands that have tried Facebook and completely failed. Their, their audience just isn't there. So, uh, whereas, you know, Facebook and Instagram work very well for other brands. So it depends on the audience. Um, I think the question mentioned events or something about events. So uh, if, if your audience is more of a, an in-person type of maybe kind of a retail uh, group, you know, there might be, you know, looking at mail-in flyers or something more physical than digital. It just depends on, yeah, again, the audience, where they're, where they're expecting to see you uh, and understanding what they're actually looking for is, is the key there. Um, but yeah, other than that, if you already have an audience, it really comes down to trying to get word of mouth out there. So there could be referral programs um, or just even, you know, creating content that engages with them in certain ways or creating, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, like a Slack, Slack group or a private Facebook community that engages them in a different way uh, by offering them uh, sneak peeks of new products coming out, um, asking them for feedback on the products or how the store is running or if you're launching new branding, asking feedback on that. Just any way you can engage that audience to, to kind of build up that, uh, that kind of community and making them feel special. The moment they feel special or that they're a part of the brand, they're going to spread the word uh, just because they're proud to be a part of that process. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. And um, as I mentioned, if we haven't gotten to any questions, then we'll do our best to get back to you after the session instead. If you haven't checked out the acquisition ebook from the Look Forward campaign yet, then you can do, now, do so now online and revisit the tactics we've talked about today. Or you can get ahead and start reading up on next week's topic, which is all about retention. That ebook is also available to download online now. So the all remains for me is to say a big thank you to our speakers. We really appreciate you taking the time out to share your thoughts today. Katie and Phil, could you let our listeners know where they can find you online? You go ahead, Katie. Yeah, um, you go to octaneai.com um, or if you have any direct questions, feel free to just email me at katie at octaneai.com. Yeah, for me, uh, getshogun.com. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me directly, it's phil at getshogun.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. And that's it, folks. Until next week, thank you for joining us and good luck.